Uh, so today we are going to discuss your questions. It's open lines. We have already a number of questions. You're welcome to uh, chime in uh, by uh, chatting with us if you're joining us on DimDim, which by the way, the class that we're in on DimDim.com is kosher. Um, and if you're joining us by, uh, via the telephone, which is 218-895-1203, the passcode is 2020 pound, and uh, we'll show you, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, if you have a question, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, tell you how to uh, join in, in, in a minute. Uh, Zev, uh, the volume is low. Uh, we have a uh, comment here on the dim dim. Can you? Okay. So, so let's uh, before we get to the questions, let's talk a couple minutes about things going on in current events. Rabbi Rosen, uh, we were talking before the show about what's happening with Turkey and Israel, and all of the uh, the, the issues that are coming up with Turkey's. Uh, creating difficulties for the Israeli government and the Israeli people. Uh, and how does that affect the hashkachas, the certifications that we give and other agencies give in Turkey? And that's your, basically your department here. One of, one of the many things, I shouldn't say the only thing, uh, but uh, among the many hats that you wear is you're in charge of the, the, the certifications in Turkey. So how does that uh, I mean, if, if we can't travel to Turkey or whatever the issues are, you want to address that for a minute? It's a very good question, and it's really left us, the Kashrus agencies, with a uh, great concern. Um, this week we had the fancy food show in the Javits Center in New York and in the Turkish Pavilion, uh, very heavily is certified by Star K certification. Uh, at the present, because of the situation, all of the certification agencies have pulled back their supervisors um, to our uh, at, at least comfort zone is that we do not have uh, productions that have to be on an ongoing basis as some of the certifications in Israel that are being done for their producers. So even though we will have a hiatus, uh, we are there periodically and you know quite with quite frequently uh, right now, we are waiting to see um, uh, a certain lull in the uh, in the action um, politically. Right now, it does not uh, bode well, and um, ho hopefully, it, the companies are hopeful that the political situation will quiet because they still are very anxious uh, to get kosher certification and to be able to come and be a player on in the U.S. marketplace. Okay, so um, basically, what, if I could just reiterate what you're saying, is that the, the, the agencies that certify product there on a constant basis, they have, may have some difficulty getting in. Correct. But the ones that are like us, we're just, we're just uh, there from time to time. Correct. Okay, so, so how long can we go without... With, well, without being there. To, uh, I guess in our comfort zone, Rabbi David Stein, who is our field representative that comes from Rehovo to Turkey this month, is um, at least in these couple of weeks, uh, is he's, his being, um, uh, his uh, certification route is taking him to Europe, to Italy and Spain, so Turkey was not supposed to be on his uh, agenda until the end of July. So hopefully by then, uh, that July is the time when apricots are in full production in Malatya in eastern Turkey. So uh, we are hopeful that by that time there's going to be uh, a significant change in, uh, in a relaxation in the travel. I mean, is that uh, really... Does it look like that? I mean, to me, it looks like it's going the other way. The, uh, well, the, the, uh, the only other fail-save is that Rabbi Stein can, is traveling on a U.S. passport, uh, as is other mashkichim that we use even from Israel. Um, it is the, uh, an Israeli, um, it, it is an Israeli problem more than a, a U.S. problem, and if we have to go ahead and to 
reorganized by taking a, an, a supervisor from the United States, uh, we may have to go to that route. Okay, so you're saying that it's not, it's only an issue right now for, the, for Israeli citizens, but for an American citizen, they could go without a problem? Correct. We would be comfortable sending someone there. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll be comfortable. Okay. All right. Okay, that's, that's, that's an answer. I mean, that uh, really brings to fore the, the, the concept that we're not there constantly. These are not, we're not producing, uh, you know, we don't have a, have a shrita over there, a slaughter, slaughtering house where we need to be there all day. Correct. We're producing things which are relatively simple that we go from time to time. Uh, okay, so let's go to some of the questions first that we got by, uh, uh, via email. Okay, I see now that the volume is working better on the, uh, on the dim-dim, so thank you, Zev. Uh, one question that we have is, is grape juice considered wine, and therefore one should not drink it during the nine days? During the nine days, uh, meaning after the first of the month of Av until the ninth of Av, which is Tisha B'Av. Um, during those nine days, we don't uh, drink wine. And the question is, is grape juice considered wine? Grape juice is considered wine, right. and it is Im Im important to to note. I mean, Shabbos we do make kiddush on wine. However, on Havdalah, it, typically there's been the custom to make uh, Havdalah during the nine days on beer. So uh, people maybe if get an overdose of wine over Shabbos and make it on grape juice. So I think that it's uh, a good uh, a good uh, time to. Uh, Try Sam Adams Star K certified beer. <laughs> That's a good uh, good point. That a lot of people do make havdalah uh, on Saturday night on beer. I personally do not, so I have two options. One is I go to Rabbi Rosen's house uh, for Shabbos and I have him make havdalah. <laughs> the other option is I have uh, one of my children. Uh, usually we try to pick a child about six or seven years old, and they make uh, havdalah. They don't make havdalah; they drink. The, the grape juice, uh, um, or the Ramah says that if a child is not available, then he himself, the adult himself, can drink grape juice. For me, the beer is just not really an option, Rabbi Rose and I. Just <laughs> Rabbi Goldberg's too young. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so that, I believe that that answers, uh, answers that question. Um, another question that has to do with the nine days with that period of time that's coming up, which is a sad period of time, is a remembrance for the destruction of the uh, temples in Jerusalem, is someone who completed a Masechta, which is a tractate of Talmud, prior to the nine days, such as the tractate of Makos, which those who learned Daf Yomi just finished uh, this past week, this, a couple days ago, are they allowed to hold off on making the Siyam until the nine days. So there's, a, there's usually a party made or small party celebration when one finishes the uh, a tractate of Talmud. And the question is, is one allowed to hold off on that until the nine days when, uh, and during that uh, celebration, have meat, drink wine, and, and so on. And uh, Well, typically we, we, the halacha states that one, would, one shouldn't uh, time it in, in such a way that it's a, as a convenience that you would have the Masechta finished uh, earlier and then you, you, you're holding off till the nine days. Um, I think that uh, in, in, in certain cases, um, in the, uh, although uh, the halacha states we, we shouldn't go ahead and, uh, and save it so you can have a, a nice steak dinner, um, I know, you know personally that some people would make a, a, a seam for a yard site and uh, is a da is a daf um is a, a studier, uh, so they would probably take that and that's as they they've planned it for their completion, which right. is right now that they'll do it. They would hold off, you mean, until right? It's planned until so they finish on the yard site, which would be fine. But uh, again, like Rabbi Rosen is saying, the Mishnah Bura rules that one should not uh, hold off on finishing a mesechta, and so then. Uh, we finished Makos this past, uh, would be uh, Monday, and so to hold off basically two weeks or more, I don't think it would be uh, our custom to do that, especially since Makos is a very small uh, Masechta, relatively, and 
you know, it, 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 uh, there are those that do it, though. There That's are correct. definitely those that do it, and if one has that custom of that it's okay to hold off, so they should follow that. There are, there are uh, authorities who allow it. Right. Interesting to note that Rav Ruderman, the, uh, the Rosh Hashiva, the, the head of uh, Nehru Yisrael, uh, the, fa- the founding Rosh Hashiva, uh, in, in, in my days when I first uh, came to Baltimore, that it was customary that in restaurants uh, that there would be one person to complete a masechta so that the participants in that restaurant would be I have a fleshic meal. Uh, it was Rabbi Ruderman's concern that people, if they did not have um, a place to go to have a, a, a kosher meal, would go elsewhere. And that was a, a fear that was in, well, obviously Rabbi Ruderman started the yeshiva in the 1930s. Um, I, I came here at the beginning of the 90s. And um, subsequent to that, uh, we, do no, we no longer do the one Masechta completion in restaurants during the night days. What is, what is our policy on that? Do, don't we have some restriction on the meat uh, restaurants? Is it only for takeout? Is, am, I, am I right? Um, it's not our, our, we don't take care of it directly, but I think it's only, but I think do that we allow sit down? What we have in, in, the, in, in the restaurants that, that they have nine day menus. That are right, they would have uh, to um, being would, able to have fish menus during the nine days. Fish, fish during if, the nine right. days. Okay, I have fish without fish, worms. Fish, right? Without worms, you know, f- uh, farm-raised fish. Fish or dairy? A dairy. But but and if they want people want meat, I think they can take it out. Correct. Is that right? Okay. Because that because that there, there is no control. Right. It could be for shoppers. Right. Right. Maybe the person is making a seam. That's correct. Right. The person is not uh, is 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 not feeling well and and needs uh, the meat and so on. Um, now, speaking about the fish, we do have a, a chatted question here, and I encourage everybody to, if you have a, a question on what we're talking about or anything having to do with uh, kosher, to, uh, to chime in. Does Rav Belsky Shlita still hold that all kosher fish, even those with anisakis, is kosher without any check-in needed? And the answer is yes. Rav Belsky still uh, does uh, hold like that, and... Um, the OU's policy follows that, you know, his his uh, his opinion. Then, interestingly, as um, we had we had the article on the Anasakis in uh, the, the the latest Kashus Currents, which uh, at the end I, I concluded that the, that this issue is still in its process of formation. Uh, other notable poskim, uh, I guess, redactors of law have uh, written uh, responsa. Rav Padua in England uh, recently wrote a responsa permitting the fish as, uh, as Rav uh, Moshe Vaya, who is uh, n- renowned in Israel as being the, bug, the, the premier bug expert per- permits the anisakis in fish. And uh, Rav Falk, in, who has wrote a, a responsa earlier, Still holds so the um, the jury is still out on both sides uh, of the issue. Our our Star K policy is to follow those gedolim uh, in in Israel in the land of Israel who uh, are uh, forbidding to eat the anisakis. Right. Currently, that's our policy. If anybody wants to see it in in writing, we can you can go to our website star k dot o r g and right there on the front page you can. Hit the button that talks that refers to this issue, and it will come up. One one uh, significant change that we did have was with salmon, canned salmon. Correct. That's wild, uh, which n- normally would be a problem, but based on various halachic reasons, uh, that it's questionable whether or not they're in the can or you can find them in the can. We uh, Rabbi Heinemann is now allowing the canned salmon, obviously with reliable certification. Uh, as long as you mash it up like you would normally when you, you, you make, a ma- make, make a salmon salad with mayonnaise or whatever. So that is a significant uh, change. I think that will be uh, well received. Um, okay, let's go to some, uh, some other issue here. Speaking about the bugs still, we can't get away from the, uh, the bugs and the worms, Rabbi Rosen, it seems to be with us. Nori sheets. This is not bugs and worms. These are crustaceans. Okay. I stand corrected. Nori sheets, what are the problems with them? Is there an issue of bugs? Do they need to be checked? The answer is yes. Nori sheets, uh, which are pressed seaweed sheets, very popular in, in the sushi community, um, 
have to be checked to make sure that in its process that small seahorses are not contained therein. Um, typically, nori sheets would go through an electric eye check to make sure that there is not there's no other foreign matter other than seaweed that's in the sheet. And uh, I think that these electric eyes are sensitive enough to detect if the, the mass matter uh, it would not match uh, the uh, seaweed, so they would be rejected. So we only certify those sheets that can go through such a, uh, a check. And then we do check some of them afterwards. We, spot, we follow up with, uh, a spot check. with spot checks. So if a person wanted to buy uncertified uh, and unflavored, because if it was flavored, it would need a certification for the flavoring, uh, just plain old roasted nori sheets, they could if they know how to check it. But it takes some, it does take some... Uh, a lot of book learning. checking takes expertise. Right, it does take some, some training and uh, we're waiting for uh, Reb Zev Steen to put together a video how to check, uh, how to check nori sheets because we've got the strawberries, we have the flour, we have the... What else do we have? The... What? Lettuce. The lettuce. So we're waiting for the one on the nori sheets. That is, in, in, in a nutshell, that's the, uh, the nori sheets. We have a question here that's being chatted. There's a GE oven which has two ovens, okay, a bottom and a top. The bottom drawer heats up to 450 degrees. Can one cook milchiks in that bottom drawer oven at the same time that fleshiks is in the upper oven? I think we concluded not at the same time. Is that right? Well, I think you have to, to make a determination how the, uh, the, the ovens are vented. If the ovens, in that, that's a, a very important thing to, to realize that an oven vents either some, some of the older models will vent in the back of the oven, some ovens are vented in the, the, uh, the last, uh, I guess, northwest uh, burner in an electric oven, uh, and a double oven can at times be either vented separately but then coupled together and if that is the case, that you're, you, you will have both uh, meat and milk venting at the same time, you may have a, um, a bus of a hull of a, a meat and milk issue in terms of its cooking. So, right, so I, I, I believe that we, uh, our policy is that uh, if they end up, or they have two vents, two separate vents, but they, they uh, then they, they join at some point, you cannot cook meat and milk at the same time, but separately you could. Uh, unless one oven vents into the other oven. I think we, we've, uh, we're on alert for that possibility yes, too. Right. The bottom one may vent into the top one and then from there go out. I think if that, if, I'm sorry, if that's the case, so then, then it's really uh, you, you couldn't even use it a, at all for, for meat, one for meat and one for dairy. Typically it's really vents from the back and I think that it's important to go ahead and check with the manufacturer how your GE oven is being, is configured. We do have, some of them are Star K certified and then we should have that information available on our, our site. We, I, I just want to identify us, uh, for those joining us late, uh, I'm Rabbi Tzvi Goldberg, this is Rabbi Tzvi Rosen, and we're here in the Star K offices in Baltimore for our monthly teleconference, which is on the last Wednesday of each month except for next month, when it will be the third Wednesday, uh, which is July uh, 21st, the day after Tisha B'Av at noon. Okay, here comes a, here's another question, Rabbi Rosen. This gets a little bit sticky. Go ahead. Is the agency OU the same regarding reliability in Israel, the same uh, as it is in the U.S., and is there a star K as well here in Israel? Okay, so this is a question from somebody who's residing in Israel and wants to know about that. That's a very good question. And you, uh, if you are residing in Israel, as you know, Israeli kashras is uh, not, I wouldn't say a political hotbed, but it's a kashras hotbed, which um, is far more complex than we have in the United States. Um, which is, which, is uh, which I tell people is counterintuitive. Right? People think that in the United States, you know, it may be, there's so many different certifications. I think the last kosher, Wakashis magazine listed uh, how, many how many hundreds in the United States, maybe 500 or more. And they think when they go to Israel that, uh, you know, Israel is the land of the Jews and it's easy to find kosher there. 
but in truth, like you say, it's more complicated. I'll yeah. give you an example where there's, there is a, uh, a, a profound difference between the OU US and OU Eretz Yisrael. In, in, in Eretz Yisrael, the OU would consider themselves to be what we call a Mahadran, a Mahadran Hersher. Mahadran Hersher would be the ones which are more scrupulous because as mandated by Israeli law, everything has to have a certification before it can be sold. And therefore, uh, they will rely on baseline certifications to be able to give the highest common um, uh, distribution of, of kosher products to the masses. Uh, those who are actually uh, desiring to have a more, more high-end kashras, which we, they called a, a, a mahadran hersher, a mahadran certification, uh, which the OU considers itself in, in Israel as well as the Star K, um, that their standards would be even tighter in Israel than you would in the United States. For example, in the United States you can purchase star kissed tuna fish with a, an OU, where the OU will not require full-time supervision on the tuna fish where it's being produced, while in Israel the star kissed tuna fish with the OU has full-time certification, full-time supervision on it, and, and they will not sell the regular star kissed in Israel because it would not be considered to be on a Mahadran level. Okay, as far as uh, probably what what he's asking is also including the uh, the restaurants and so on that the OU is certifying there. And I don't think we would want to comment necessarily. We don't we don't have direct knowledge or we're not uh, we didn't review the restaurants and right. so on. But we did have experience with uh, some of our some of our certifications there uh, a number of years ago. We we did have a Star K Israel uh, program where we started the, the, the procedures of giving certifications to some restaurants, and we found it very difficult, a uh, very difficult environment to to keep to uh, the standard that we would require over here right. in, in a restaurant situation. It's important to note that in Israel, um, where you you will have certification being given by an agency in both a restaurant and in a hotel. Hotels typically may have a more strict uh, uh, setup because each hotel has its own particular Rav HaMachshir, rabbi who's the resident rabbi who is responsible for the hotel. Uh, in a restaurant, it's not as tight, and therefore you would have to really be able, have to check each particular um, restaurant or hotel to see if it reaches your kashrus comfort level. I, um, I just want to point out that in Israel, if you look on a typical tuda, a letter of certification in a restaurant, it lists the name of the mashkiach and usually his cell phone number. Oh, really? Yeah, usually his, uh, usually we'll have that information there, which is, I've never seen it in the United States. There it has the name of the agency. But in Israel, you, if many times you go to the, you look at the Tuda, which you should check. You should really check it to see that it's current and that it's valid. And if you have any questions, you should be able to uh, speak to the mashkiach if he's supposed to be on site. Or if not, you can give him a call and ask him. It's, it's, it, that, that little um, tidbit of information is not given here in, in the United States. Here, it, we, we, we don't put the mashkiach Mashkiach's uh, name down, we just put just the agency. If you yeah. want, you can call the Star K or the OU. Right. There is an, an, another very fundamental difference between giving, giving uh, kosher supervision here in, in a town like, such as Baltimore, where you will have all your, ho your restaurants uh, along a uh, two to three mile drag, and that will be the, uh, your, your base of operation. While when you're certifying a country uh, and it's replete with restaurants uh, all over, your task is uh, a lot more formidable. I remember I went into uh, a restaurant in Israel and it was not an OU or a Star K place, but uh, a place with what would be considered, I guess, a reasonable certification. And the certification letter listed, it said uh, rabbi on site and it had his name, cell phone number, and I asked the the uh, people behind the counter. Can I speak to the mashkiach, to the, to the supervising rabbi? I want to talk to him, see what's going on. I said, Well, he's not here now. Well, the letter says he's supposed to be here. So wh where is he? 
Well, he leaves at 11, so he's not here any yeah. longer. Anecdotally, Rabbi, I happened to be in Marseille this year, and the rabbi told me to go to a particular restaurant, which was open, uh, and I came there. There, the, the, in, in France, they do not call the mash, a mashkiach, I mean, the, the supervisor a mashkiach, they call him a shomer, which is a watchman. So I asked him, says, the, the shomer is not here yet to unlock the oven. So I had to wait about 45 minutes until the shomer came, and then I was able to have my meal. Oh, okay, well, that's good. Oh, that it was excellent. Able to, uh, you weren't able to, uh, it's it maybe inconvenient for a person who wants to eat, uh, but it's good for kashras. I was pleased. Okay, good. <laughs> um, we do have some more questions over here. Let's take, take them. Okay. Uh, according to those who say that one must cover the knob of a crockpot for Shabbos, is there any problem if this covering falls off on Shabbos? What, the background for this is that uh, um, the crockpot, well, let's say you're cooking your chulant in there, you want to make it what we call grufo ktuma, and either you want to line it with with aluminum foil, according to some opinions, or you want to cover the knob or remove the knob. So let's say you covered that knob before Shabbos, and then it fell off on Shabbos. Is there any problem with the food? And um, I was thinking about this question when we, when we got it. I don't really know why you wouldn't be able to just put the covering back on. Right. It's not, it, it, yeah. You're not the, the idea. The idea being that it's supposed to be some sort of a sign, as you'd either take off the knobs or to be able to cover the knobs so that you wouldn't adjust it. But the food is already cooked before Shabbos, and um, well, that that has to be a proviso before you can right. use it. But as long as your food is cooked before Shabbos, you'd be able to partake of the food on on Shabbos. Well, even if it even if it wasn't cooked, and he was, w- which it's ideally supposed to be, but if he covered the knob and he left it in, let's say, partially cooked, right. and then it fell off, I, I don't know why he wouldn't be able to put it put it back on. And I, I don't really see it a great uh, a great uh, issue with that. Um, okay, if anybody has uh, any questions, you can uh, uh, join us with through Dim Dim and chat with us, or by telephone, hit star six, and you can unlock yourself. I do want to mention that coming up next week, uh, in about a week and a half actually, we have our Star K summer program training in Kashras. And we have a, a very interested group as we do every year. I think this is our seventh or eighth year that we're doing it. And as usual, we have more applicants than unfortunately we can, we can handle. And, um, you know, we're very, very much looking forward to it. Right, and germane to that is that uh, we're having this year uh, Rabbi David Stein from right. Israel, who is our Starkey Field representative uh, actually in, in, in Eretz Yisrael and in Europe uh, and in Turkey. And he's going to be addressing the group and I think a lot of the questions that um, you raise in terms of Hashkocha and Eretz Yisrael, uh, he has written uh, extensively in Kashus Currents about the differences been in shechita and in dairy and in the other produced products. Well, we, what we've asked him to address here is um, how does one living in Chutzlars in the diaspora how does he deal with the uh, the tithing, the truma semisrus, the orla, the shemitah, the sabbatical year? Because it's it's confusing for us, uh, for those who live in the United States. Um, when you get an, an apple from Israel, an orange, do you have to worry that it might be something from the first three years of growth and then it, it, would be, uh, uh, it wouldn't be sufficient to tithe it? It would, it would be completely forbidden. So do you have to worry about that and, you know, those kind of issues? Right. It's interesting, Rabbi Stein told me that when he was first married, he, he, his wife lived on a moshav and the wedding presents that the moshav gave um, the young couple is that he learned, studied extensively in a Shemitah kolel that, that for two years. Oh, really? And that, okay. gave him, that was able to go ahead and to give him uh, a very sound uh, background on right. all these issues. As far as the uh, orla goes, the fruits that are forbidden for the first three years, I was discussing that this year with Rabbi Stein, and he uh, mentioned that there are five opinions, five basic opinions. 
Right. So uh, yeah, it's not, you know, it, 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 it's a confusing subject, and we need, right. we, we want to get some more clarity on it. That's correct. You, 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 if you're in Israel, you'd have to go look at the charts and see, pro, you know, the probabilities. We, we, we've written about that also. Well, in Israel, actually, I think that we, we, as far as the fruits go, it might be a little bit easier because you're not going to buy anything, any fruit, without a reliable certification. That is correct. Here in the United States, we don't certify. For, you can't go into the supermarket and if it says Jaffa oranges, you're not going to look for a certification That's in a typical correct. supermarket. So you're stuck on your own. Right. So actually, I think for Israelis, it's uh, somewhat easier. And I found that when I was in Israel during the, uh, the Shemitah sabbatical year, you, you just basically, you, you don't ask any questions. You're just relying on your particular certification, whichever it might be. They take care of it. And some, many people living there know very little about the actual laws because they don't have to. And here, since it's not as, uh, it's not, it doesn't come up that often, we don't have a particular uh, eye on it all the time. And sometimes the questions uh, come up more often in the United States than they do in, in Israel. Um, here, here the, the, the person who asked the, uh, the knob question about the crockpot, so you're saying that your son insists on taping on the covering over the knob. I don't know why you would be, have to tape it on. I think it would be sufficient just to, if you had some tinfoil, to, uh, yeah. to surround, right. surround the Scru knob. Scrunch it on. Scrunch it on. That's, that's, the, that's the proper way to say it. <laughs> right. It's a term of art. Or you could also take off the knob. Take off the knob. It also makes a difference to be able to allow you to. Some knobs. Some knobs have springs on it. You know. You won't okay. Be, then you won't be able to fix it afterwards. Right. Okay, Rabbi Rosen. Is there anything else that we wanted to get to urgent, or is it uh, basically we've? Uh, <laughs> okay. Do we still have time? We have a couple of minutes. Is there anything else that uh, we? I just wanted to. I, I happened to. Um, I've taken a, a trip just to check on our Hall of Israel farms. I think that the, the listenership might be uh, interested in knowing, um, you know, that probably one of the central issues that we have on dairy farms is if a cow uh, develops a, a, a problem called a displaced abomasin, as they call it, a DA, um, where, where there's a, a gas buildup in, in, the, in the stomach of the cow, of how to be able to uh, alleviate the problem without making the cow... Uh, non-kosher, because if you uh, if you do something invasive in the abomasin, you make a, a puncture or a hole to release the gas, then the the, the milk cow is not may may be grow to be healthy again, but cannot be uh, used for kosher production. So in our farms in Pennsylvania, we've instructed the uh, the veterinarians to do a, a similar operation as they do in all the dairy farms in Israel. Where they, they they've learned and are taught to to be able to suture an animal without doing any type of invasive invasive action, there, thereby saving uh, the dairy cows and uh, not puncturing any type of a um, any any type of an organ. Is there is the uh, mashkiach the supervisor the, the, watching him the when he does it? The supervisor is watching him uh -huh. and it, with, with with avid interest. Mm -hmm. Every every time we have a, one, a supervisor that lives there twenty four seven and therefore he's on call. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you buy the Chol Yisrael milk, so you're assured that it doesn't have any problems with the uh, with the DA cows. And uh, do all of the certifying agencies do it like that, or is there some in Isra differences? In Israel, they do it, but that Israel does not have the luxury of having a supervisor living that they have to have something like Hatzalah, an on-call <laughs> rabbi, to go ahead and okay. get to the farm. Uh, others do not have the, um, I guess you'd say, the, uh, that, that type of a cooperation. So they'll either have to milk the, the cow separately, which in some of the farms they milk them separately, in other farms, they'll have to sell off the DAs, and sometimes we do that as well. And therefore, or they will, they will have to have uh, separate barns where you will have separate milkings. Uh -huh. So if, if a person buys any Chal of Yisrael milk in the United States, can he be assured that this problem was taken care 100%. of? 100%. Okay, okay, that's good. Good. Uh, we have a comment here. There is so much choice nowadays in the fruit store. Why buy Israeli produce with all its inherent problems? It's easy to avoid. That that's uh, okay. There's some truth to that. Uh, the other hand is that we want to support uh, the farmers in Israel, and if if a person knows what he's doing and knows how to properly eat Israeli produce, then he would be 
uh, recommended or encouraged to buy Israeli produce. If a person is not certain, then I definitely would uh, would stay away. A lot of times, I get a call from a, a person who went into Costco, correct, and they have Israeli peppers. For some reason, Costco always <laughs> you get that that same correct. call, right? So and, and it's beautiful produce, and it's, right. you know, they and they feel that they want to support Israel. Uh, right. So, well, people buy it. The, the calls I get usually they buy it and then they bring it home and they see, oh no, it says product of Israel or Israel and Mexico, and they want to know how to how to deal with it. Uh, and on a vegetable like that, if it's not the sabbatical year, it's fairly easy to tithe. You know, if you go through the steps, uh, it's not it's not it doesn't have a question of the orla that we mentioned before, and it's not a sabbatical year issue. So it's fairly easy to deal with. Night we explained how to deal with it over the phone, and then I tell them to look at Rabbi Rosen's article, which, uh, uh, which is available at the Star K yeah. site. And I see that someone asked the question of how many Americans really know what they're doing. <laughs> about, about tithing. Uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good question. And uh, that's why we have. Yeah, and Is he asking I, about kashrus or in general? How many I don't know. Americans maybe they're at, maybe they're know what they're doing, <laughs> or maybe they're talking about doing the operations on the count. No, I think he's talking uh-huh. about the. Yeah, he's talking about the. It's true. That's a good point. If a person doesn't know what he's doing with reference to Israeli produce, then yes, he's, I, I would agree. You should know that, that there is a default position that you know a person would go ahead and just say follow what the dictates of the Chazon Ish is, and you know sort of a, that that would kind of cover it. If, but you have to really know what you have to take off. That makes it a little simpler. Uh, isn't that old, the old cow problem that the poskim were We're going back between cows and right. fruits. Um, okay, so I don't know if there, there are those. There are, again, there are those who are mater, and there are those who are not. Uh, you know, we we do have the dictum that a if you see that a cow can live for 12 months after a after taking ill or having being in a questionable status, which after we know that the even if you had you were invasive in in, in an abo mason, which uh, that's corrective surgery. And typically, the cow can, the cow can live. live, right? Um, but nevertheless, we take um, try to take a, a, a stringent view so that every the particular group who may not want to rely on any types of uh, leniencies. So we every, that's a, another thing, like the fish. We try to take the high road. Right. When a person is buying the chalvi sorrel milk, which is a higher level of kosher than the regular milk that you buy, he he. Is not intending on getting himself involved in a in a halachic question. Um, There's another good question of it. Accordingly, all star K dairy non chavisrol is a problem. Well, <laughs> it's a very good question. Yeah. And and, and, and ironically, when that when the, 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 this particular problem, well, as I have noted, hit the fore on 1994. That's when this whole DA issue sort of uh, erupted. And uh, the the ironic the ironic um, uh, state of affairs was that because we are on the farm with the mashkiach witnessing what's happening with the in in terms of the cows, we would ha- we were able to 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 basically target the problem. And we we maybe we must target the problem. That's correct. Right? If somebody buys non chalav Israel, basically the this this issue is. Is not a, as far-reaching as people may think that it is. It's a very small percentage of the cows that are suffering with the A's and certain, and, and it, we, it has been found that with diet it can actually be prevented. So, in a non of Israel situation where you buy the milk in the store, we apply the principle of that it goes that the milk has come from the majority, as we call called the parsh meruba kaparsh. It goes from the majority of cows who are healthy and therefore the problem is not an, an issue. So when he's buying, but, but, but for Chol of Yisrael we perhaps have an obligation to take care of it like you mentioned well, because absolutely. we are there and we can take care of it. Correct. And otherwise, we, but by the non Chol we're relying on nullification perhaps. Right. Um, on a different subject, if one gives a bottle of wine as a gift is he mechuyev? Is he obligated to notify the recipient that it is non mevushal so it's non cooked wine, and therefore there are certain ways that you have to deal with that wine? Uh, I mean, anybody can really, if he's giving it to a uh, religious person, that person sh- usually would be aware that he can look on the bottle to see if it is mevushal or not. Then, if you have your issue, if you're giving it to a non-observant 
person, then then that's that's a, okay, a that much is, more sticky. That, that would issue. be a question. I would to a non-observer person, I would give not. I would not give them a bottle of non mavushal okay. wine. I would give them only wine that is mavushal. Uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, there are no longer any tums that carry a hechsher. However, CVS and acids are Star K certified. Okay, well that's good to know. The um, we do have uh, tums like. I products think, with the Star right. K. And I think you probably can go to our Star K uh, medicine list uh, where you have a, a listing of even if it doesn't have carry the certification on it and that there right. is some a, of, a some of the, I think some of the Tums would be okay even without any, any certification but when it has a certification you get that additional oversight that you know you know that it's kosher not just sort of assuming that it, that it is kosher. Okay I think we'll wrap it up there Rabbi Rosen. I want to thank you and Thank Every, you very much for having everyone for, for uh, joining us. Uh, we are here every month, usually the last Wednesday of the month at uh, 12 noon at dimdim.com. The, the keyword is kosher. And on the phone, we are at 218-895-1203. Passcode is 2020 pound. Next month, we will be, join, we will be uh, having the class on July 21st, which is... Uh, not the last Wednesday of the month, but the previous one. And this class, if you'd like to review it or have want to tell a friend about it, is located at kosherclasses.org. It's archived there under webinars. And you can go there and find it or um, tell your friends about it. We want to thank everyone very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Great. Take care. Bye-bye.